If you have your Bible, turn with me to Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7, we are walking through Revelation, verse by verse, line by line, and uh, we are at chapter 7. The title of my message today is one word, redemption. Redemption. Folks, there is no better word in Christian language than redemption. It is what Jesus Christ has done for you. You can't save yourself You can't work your way into heaven. You can't be good enough. You can't go to church enough. You can't give enough. You can't witness enough to get into heaven. But you can die to self, ask for forgiveness of your sins, and invite Jesus Christ to be Lord of your life. That is salvation. And redemption here is mentioned, and it is a huge word in our text before us. It really is. Let me give you the outline. If you have your bulletin and want to follow along, number one, and by the way, Betty, I have two points today. (laughs) Two. So you picked a good Sunday to do that. (laughs) Number one, the the 144,000 sealed Jews. 144,000. And the second point is the multitude of saved Gentiles. Folks, there's been some great revivals in the history of mankind. Uh, All through the centuries, we have seen some revivals. But according to the Word of God and what we will see today, this will be the greatest revival in all of mankind. And isn't it just like God to save His best for last? And folks, God clearly here is doing things that he has not done before. And when we walk through the book of Revelation, uh, we have to look at it, uh, yes, symbolic, symbolically, but also literally. You know, in chapter 7 of Revelation, it is an interlude between the 6th and 7th seal. Chapter 6 showed us a time of unbelievable disasters, unending terror and death that that will result during the tribulation of the first five seals. They were bad enough, but the opening of the sixth seal, which we covered last week, called the Day of the Lord, will far surpass the first five seals. The world as a whole will refuse to acknowledge God's warnings. There will be two groups of people that will survive the divine judgment of God. The first group will be Jewish evangelists who will be under the divine protection of God. The second group of people will be the saved Gentiles who will be martyred and ushered into heaven. While God is a God of wrath and judgment, He is also a God of mercy and grace. Let's look at this incredible scripture in Revelation 7 where we see one of the greatest revivals ever seen by mankind. John's first vision begins in verse 1, and his second vision begins in verse 9. Redemption, the 144,000 sealed Jews. The Bible says, after these things, what is that after? The sixth seal is what he is talking about. I saw four angels standing at the four corners of earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth or on the sea or uh, or on any tree. When we see the four angels, we know angels are messengers of God, and we have seen angels all through the book of Revelation. And then when we see the four corners of the earth, it is talking about direction here. Direction, all right? North, south, east, and west. Uh, Early... You know, in history, there were people that thought the world was flat. And this is no reference to that whatsoever. It's simply saying God is in control of every direction of everything that goes on in this world. And it says, uh, standing in the four corners on the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, uh, that it should not blow the earth, sea, or trees. And what these angels were doing, we said that there was a pause 
between the sixth and the seventh seal. And what they are doing is they are holding back the wind. And the wind here uh, is symbolic of judgment. So there is here in this first verse a calm before the storm. And folks, I am telling you, when you walk through the book of Revelation, there are storms brewing in every chapter. The wrath of God is being seen. And I know what some people think, well, what about the love of God? Folks, He has shown us the love of God. God's shown His love through His Son, Jesus Christ. But when it comes to this time, God is taking back what was rightfully taken from Him. Not taken, but He allowed that to happen. But Satan right now, as Betty uh, said, Satan is running wild in, in the earth. He is running crazy in our country. Mass shootings are, are at a record level. All these things that used to not even be talked about, they make movies and they glorify sin. And we should not, uh, you know, be, be, we, we should not be a part of that, folks. God in this is judging uh, mankind. And, and at this particular time, He says, wait on the judgment. And the other thing about the judgment are the future judgments. We're talking about the seals right now, but the trumpet and the bowl judgments, bowl's judgments are even harsher and more intense than the seals. Now look at verse 2. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east. And folks, we know that Jesus is coming in from, he is coming from the east. He is coming to the east. When it, that sky breaks open, look towards the east. Even where John was standing there. And remember, this is on earth. The first scene is on earth. All right? The second scene is in heaven. Israel was, was towards the east where he was standing. And it says, And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was granted to harm the earth of the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And what this angel was saying, he was commanding them. He was, he was uh, you know, the messenger for God saying, you four don't do anything right now because I have a job for this other angel to do. And that was the sealing of uh, the Jews. And when you look here, it talks about the sealing on their forehead. We know later on, uh, just, just past here, that the Antichrist is going to have a seal also. He is going to have a mark on his people. And that will be the mark of the beast, which is 666, which we will get into. But also, God, in this time, protects. And that's what a seal is. It, that's what seals are talking about. Possession, okay, and protection. The Antichrist would have killed these Jews if he could. But God seals them first for the purpose of revival and the spreading of the gospel. And folks, the thing you have to understand is when the rapture of the church happens, it will get everyone's attention. Because, uh, you know, Christians will be flying planes. Christians will be driving cars. Christians will be out and all at once, all these people leave uh, earth in the rapture. And I'm telling you, chaos is going to break out. And we said that's when the Antichrist is going to come on the scene and make a pact with Israel and say that he is going to protect them. But we have already covered what is going to to happen. So when you look at the seals, it is very, very important. Do you realize as a Christian, you have a seal on you? Say, well, Brother Mike, I look in the mirror, I don't see no seal. You know what the seal is? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. 2 Corinthians 1, 21. Now he who is God, who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who also has 
sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Oh, don't you, don't you thank God that you have been sealed? Don't you thank God that you have the assurance that nothing can harm you without God's permission? Don't you thank God that uh, you can't lose your salvation? And folks, that is what it's talking about here, the seal of the Holy Spirit. And I want to I just say this. Uh, there are people, uh, and again, I, I believe, this, this is my opinion, all right, in the book of Revelation, there are people that believe when the rapture of the church happens, the Holy Spirit leaves at that point. It leaves earth. But according to this chapter, that could not happen. That is not what's going to happen. Because how are these folks going to be sealed? It'll be with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will be here. And I kind of know what they're basing their scriptures on, that everybody has a chance. But only, folks, only God knows how many chances he's given people. And so it look, according to scripture here, the Holy Spirit will still be here, but the power of the Antichrist, I'm just telling you, it's going to be very, very strong. And I said this earlier, if you can't confess Jesus Christ as Lord in the day of grace, in the church age which we live in, then you probably will not do it when it's going to cost you your life. So we need to thank God that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. And that's what he is talking about here, to protect these 144,000 Jewish evangelists. Look at verse 4, and I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000. All of the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. We see the tribe of Judah. I'm not going to read all of them. I'm just going to say the names. Reuben, Gad, Asher, Nep Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zebulun, and Joseph, and Benjamin. And we see in the Old Testament there's 19 different combinations in the Old Testament of these tribes. And some, some people want to, you know, uh, debate and, and try to decide who is what. And folks, all I know is God knows which tribe it is, and God has the tribes numbered. So if God does that, then I'm not sweating who exactly that is. All I know is he said this is what going to happen. Now look at Joel 2. Joel, look in the Old Testament. And I keep popping over there so we will understand that the Old Testament is a reference to the New Testament. And the New Testament is reference to the Old Testament when it comes to Scripture. The Old Testament in Joel, this is prophetic Scripture of things to come. And these were written you know, years and years, many, many, many years apart. That's why I believe the Word of God, because it tells us and it shows us and it proves to us what is said and predicted in prophecy happens in the New Testament. And God's Word is always true. His promises will always come true. Now, Joel chapter 2, verse 28, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour my spirit out on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also my, ma my men servants and all my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. You say, well, Brother Mike, how do you know that's the period that we're talking about? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Let's read the rest of the scripture. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. Is that not word for word what we studied last week? In the sixth seal. So folks, the, God's word is true. It is yes, it is amen. And if God says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. Remember, the tribulation is the first half, which we are in now, and we are talking about in Revelation. All right? The great tribulation, that is going to be even 
worse. Verse 32, and it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. See, we think that's the New Testament thing, but there are many quotes in Scripture in the New Testament that are exact quotes from the Old Testament, and the writers were different, different men and in a different time period, but they are exactly what the Word of God said. And it says, for in Mount Zion, in Jerusalem, there shall be deliverance. Oh, my friend, one day Jesus is going to come back, folks. He is going to take over Jerusalem again, and he is going to rule, and we will be part of that millennium kingdom. As the Lord has said, among the remnants who the Lord calls. Matter of fact, Acts 12, we are talking about the New Testament church. One more scripture before we go on. Acts chapter, excuse me, Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. The Bible says, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Folks, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. Jesus is everything to our doctrine. Jesus is everything to our faith. Jesus was the one that was sent from heaven by God. The Holy Spirit was placed inside of Mary. Jesus was born of a virgin. A virgin. He was sinless. He was perfect. He lived a perfect life. He lived 33 years and died on a cross. And that is redemption. What's redemption? He didn't stay in the grave. After three days, Jesus arose from the death, uh, having victory over death, and now sits at the right hand of God. So we see the 144 sealed Jews spoken of here in Revelation. And this all takes place on earth. And now, starting in verse 9, everything moves to heaven. It moves to heaven. The Bible says, the multitude of saved Gentiles, and after these things, after these things that had happened before, it's what he's talking about, I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number. Folks, I am telling you, you know, again, we have seen revivals all over the world, and we've seen literally thousands of people saved, but you can name them and number them. This is saying there are going to be so many people saved. Why? Because they saw the rapture of the church. They were left behind. And I'm telling you, they are going to, and, and many people will figure out, hey, it was the Christian. That was the common denominator in these people leaving earth. And I'm telling you, and, and again, fo folks, I know the Antichrist will be at his thing, and he will be doing his thing. And he will destroy people during this time of tribulation. And part of these are the people that come to know Christ because of these Jewish evangelists that were sharing the gospel here on earth. And the reason they are up in heaven at this time is because they will become martyrs. They will stand for their faith. Uh, their faith. They will testify. They will not deny that Jesus Christ is Lord. And these are innumerable. And notice what else about them is. Of all nations and tribes and peoples and tongues. This is not just one nation. This is not just the United States. It is all the world. It is all the world. There'll be so many of these, these judgments and these seals, things happen. And, and, you know, everything from volcanoes to earthquakes to the sun, dark. And, and people are, are realizing that this thing is real. This is real. And these folks will put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ because of these Jewish evangelists. And by the way, there's basically four different types of religion that claims that they are the 144. 
And I'm not going to name them, but I'm simply saying, I will go by the Word of God, and we will go by what the Word of God says. And it says, now look at this, standing before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed in white robes. That's how we know they are saved. It is the righteousness of God. It is the purity in, in white stands for holiness. Folks, I cannot tell you how holy God is. I cannot tell you how holy heaven will be. No temptation, no sin, no attitude, no lies, no deception. A perfect place. And they are standing before Jesus with palm branches in their hand. What does that remind you of? Remember Jesus before Passion Week came riding, it, riding in on a donkey? And people laid their coats on the ground and they were waving palm branches. And you know what it is a sign of? It is a sign of praise and it is a sign of victory. Oh, folks, one of the things that Christians in the early years would do is they would put up this. And when we put this up, we're thinking peace. But do you know what that meant to the early Christian? It meant victory. Victory. Folks, we win because God wins. So we see this group of saved Gentiles with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So we see this praise and this worship breaks out in heaven. And by the way, if you don't like a church service, you probably aren't going to enjoy heaven. Matter of fact, I'm not so sure you're even going there, to be honest with you. I'm not trying to be ugly, but if you can't take this, how are you going to take that forever and ever and ever and ever? Folks, I cannot describe to you how great heaven's going to be. And towards the end of the book of Revelation, I just agree with Jesus' word. Even come now, Lord Jesus. And the Bible says, And all the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God. Oh, folks, we didn't come here just to say we attended church. We came here today to worship God, to worship Jesus Christ, to sense the Holy Spirit in this place, to praise His name and to recognize God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit uh, and who they are and saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power be to our Lord God forever and ever. Folks, these are the saved Gentiles. Hold your finger there and go to Isaiah 1 with me. I want to throw some old scripture in here, Old Testament scripture. Isaiah 1, this is the prophet Isaiah speaking early in the book of Isaiah. Look at verse 16. And folks, these are characteristics of the redeemed. Characteristics. And these are characteristics we need to have in our life even today. Wash yourselves and make yourselves clean. And it's not talking about a bath there. Now, no, everyone needs a bath and a shower. That's not what I mean. It's simply saying, stay clean. Confess up. Don't make peace with sin. Ask for forgiveness of your sin. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless and plead for the widow. We as Christians need to do these things in our lives. And then the part I wanted you to see, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. Oh, I'm telling you, folks, when you invited Jesus Christ into your life, you put off your dirty, filthy rags. You took them off. 
and you invited Jesus into your life, and Jesus put a white robe on you. Oh, folks, what a, what a beautiful uh, thing. What a beautiful thing that happens in our life. At the end of our life, I am telling you, Jesus will see you in a white robe, and we praise the Lord for that. Now let's keep reading in verse 13 back in Revelation. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? And again, we, we are talking about redemption. All right, They come from the tribulation period. These are the Gentiles from all nations and tongues. And it says in verse 14, And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Do you realize there are some denominations taking blood out of their hymnals? Taking them out. Folks, the blood of Jesus is everything. It was shed for you and I. Matter of fact, two weeks from today, we will be taking the Lord's Supper. And it is a reminder of Jesus' blood that was shed for us. It is a reminder of Jesus' body that was broken for us. It will be a memorial in a time of thanksgiving for God sending His Son and Jesus shedding His blood for us. Verse 15, Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. Oh, folks, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and we need to serve God a night and day. But do you realize when we get to heaven, our final place, there will be no temple? There's no reason for one. Why? Because God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit are there. They are there. And I thank God, I thank God for our sanctuary. Folks, if I hear you call it an auditorium, I will correct you. This is not an auditorium. Most auditoriums are place, places, or, or we even use the word venues of entertainment. We are not entertaining anybody here today. We are lifting up the name of Jesus Christ. This is His sanctuary. And heaven is our final resting place. And He who sits on the throne will dwell within. And they shall neither hunger nor anymore or thirst anymore, and the sun shall not strike them nor any heat. What is the reminder here of what these tribulations uh, folks went through of all I mean they're almost like plagues that we were talking about all these uh, these judgments these seals judgment many of them had to go through all those things all right where meteors are hitting the earth and killing people and people are wanting to go in caves and hide from them and so he's saying I am telling you around the throne there is it's nothing but peace in tranquility. Look at verse 17. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of water. Oh, folks, our water, and I've been to four uh, countries, third world countries, and the thing you have to make sure is don't drink their water. I'm serious. It will, it will hurt you, all right? And man's water has been unclean for a long time. But I'm telling you, we can drink from the fountain that is in heaven. We can literally pour it out of our hand and drink it, and, and everything will be okay. Why? Because Jesus is the living water. And it says, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And I thought about that. This is not the only place uh, that it speaks of wipe away every tear. As we know in Revelation 21, that says it again. And I've had this asked me 
several times. What about when we get to heaven and we don't and we we possibly notice that somebody's not there that we thought was there or what should be there? And do you know what I believe? When we get our glorified bodies, that God is going to erase the bad memories from our life, and we will be totally focused on God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Folks, I don't think you understand how peaceful it is going to be. There is no chaos. There is no cursing. There is no hate. There is no murders. There is no fear in heaven. And he's simply saying, these folks died for the cause of Christ. And he will take care of them. Oh, folks, I am telling you, in our Scripture, notice back in verse 17, in the midst of the throne, will shepherd them. Folks, I believe there's no greater shepherd than Jesus Christ our Lord. Would you turn with me to Psalm 23? Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. This is the writing of David. The writings of David, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still water. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Oh, folks, I cannot, I could spend the next 20 minutes telling you what the shepherd will do for you and can do for you and has done. For you. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. My cup runneth over. A oh, folk, God blesses us immensely. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In the final scripture, Matthew 24, 14. And remember, this is one of the greatest, this will be the greatest uh, revival in the history of mankind. Look at verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, then the end will come. What is he saying? That's the 144,000. That's the Gentiles who are saved. Then they'll go, then, then they will, they there will go through the rest of the tribulation, which again, it is going to be crazy, insane. Hollywood couldn't even make this stuff up the way the last uh, bowl judgment are in the trumpet judgment. And then you know what's going to happen? <laughs> Jesus is coming. He's going to be on that white horse. He is going to take Satan. He's going to take the Antichrist. And he's going to take the false prophet and toss them out. That, that battle of Armageddon, he will destroy the enemy. He will take back what's rightfully his. And folks, I am telling you, we will live with him and go into the millennial kingdom and live with him forever and ever and ever. So there's one very, very important question for everyone in this building. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? Are you sure if the rapture of the church happened today, you would be raptured out of here? And folks, I'm telling you, it's the greatest decision anybody could make. It is the best decision anybody could, could make. And it's free. Redemption. God's grace at Christ's expense. Father, I thank you for your word. And God, I thank you that uh, you are just opening up heaven for us to see. And God, my prayer today is if there's one here today that does not know you, 
God, I pray that they would come and accept you into their life. God, I pray that uh, the Holy Spirit would just deal with their hearts. And God, today could be their day of salvation. God, I know the Holy Spirit is moving. And God, I know He wants everyone saved. But He's not going to make anyone be saved. It's a choice. Everybody has the freedom of choice. But God, I too want to remind us that our time is short. We do not know the day or the hour. And God, I pray that everyone here, even today, will be right with you. And I pray that we would be as the 144,000, that we would be sharing the gospel with people around here, around here, that we would be Christian evangelists. And God, that's what you that's what you're all about, God. You are about salvation, and you are about redemption. So God, if there's Christians here that need to rededicate their life to Christ, I pray it be so. God, if there's there people here that need to come for baptism, I pray it be so. If others want to join our church, they know who we are. They know what we believe. God, I pray that you would just move in their lives. God, we love you. This is your church. This is your time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?